Okay, so our last section we're going to look at on vectors uh, is basically looking at vectors in 3D space. All right? So we're not looking at them flat anymore, we're looking at them in 3D space. So first thing is we're not really going to do a lot of sketching. Um, that's how we started when we learned vectors in 2D, but sketching in 2D is pretty easy. Sketching in 3D, although it's the same concept, it's just kind of hard to visualize stuff in 3D, unless you do it like on a computer. And then you can kind of like take your image and rotate it and look at it. Um, so we're not going to do a ton of sketching. What we've been doing all week has been graphing stuff down there. Okay? That's the XY plane. So you could think of that as like the bottom of the box or like this table. Z is coming up off of it. Okay, so it'd be like a line coming straight out of the table. And Z can be positive and it can be negative. Um, the easiest way to figure out which direction is which, kind of a trick if you just use your right hand. Um, if I wanted to say each finger is going to represent an axis, right? your index finger is the x-axis, middle finger is the y-axis, your thumb is the z. So x, y, z. And the way you can figure out which way each axis goes is you point in the direction of the x-axis. So if your positive x-axis went towards the door, then your positive y-axis would be towards the front board, and the positive z-axis would be up. That's how you can figure out which way is which. If you do it with your left hand, everything comes out the same except Z. So if you line up your middle finger and index finger, what happens is your thumbs point in opposite directions. So if you were doing your left hand, you'd get the wrong way for Z. Your right hand will give you the correct way. Right? So that's, this is actually called a right-handed coordinate system, and that's in your, um, it's in your packet. So any question on that idea? So X, Y, Z. So now we're going to basically look at everything we did in 2D and just extend it to 3D. Every formula is pretty much the same. So you really don't have to do anything that much different. It's just look at the pattern you already have and extend it for the Zs. Anything that will be different is the very last, last thing we do. So everything I do, I'm basically going to give you the 2D version like, recall, I'll put the 2D version, and then below it, I'll put the 3D version. So you already know the 2D version of everything. If you want to write it down again, you can, but you've been writing this stuff all week. It's just the 3D version that's new. So in 2D, that's how you find the distance between two points. That's the distance formula. Now, the distance formula is really based on um, just a theorem from geometry. What, what theorem is, does the distance formula come from? Sam? Uh, the uh, Pythagorean theorem. The Pythagorean theorem. Yep. So the distance formula, it's just the Pythagorean theorem written with coordinates. Square one side of your triangle, square the other side, add them up and take the square root. So. If you had two points, and this is x1, y1, this is x2, y2, we're just finding the length of that segment. Basically by going like this. And that's these two expressions. That gives you the length of the bottom, that gives you the height of the triangle, and then we're plugging them into the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so now, Let's look at that formula in 3D. In 3D, the first thing they would have to give you is two three-dimensional coordinates. The starting point would have an x, y, and z, and the ending point would have an x, y, and z. Okay. Now, if we want to find the distance between two points in 3D, all we have to do is take the 2D formula and extend the pattern one more time for the z's. So what do you think I would need to put added on to that 2D version? All right, I would put a plus. Go ahead and tell me. 
two yeah, minus x one squared plus y two minus one y one squared plus x two minus x one squared. All right, you said that one twice. I mean z. Z. Z is two minus z one squared. Yes. All you have to do is extend the same pattern you see one more time, but now do it for the z's. So you still got the x two minus x one squared. Still got the y two minus y one squared. Just do it one more time. Z two minus Z one squared. Okay, and except for the very last thing we do, that's how every formula is going to work. Just take the pattern you already see, do it one more time. Okay. So let's find the distance between those two points. So P1 is the point negative 1, 3, 2, and P2 is the point 4, negative 2, 5. All right, so Alec, if I want to set that up um, to find the distance, um, what's the first thing I should write down? You should fill in the formula with the values that you have. Okay. Two points, so it would be the square root. Yep, that's good. You put the square root first so you don't forget that. Some people forget that part. All right, and keep going. And then it would be in parentheses 4 plus 1 because it's negative 1. Yep, so I'm just going to do it in two steps, but he, he already simplified it. 4 minus negative 1 gives you 4 plus 1. And then you add to that in parentheses again, um, negative 2 minus 3 squared. So he's got y2 minus y1, yep. And then you add in parentheses 5 minus 2 squared. 5 minus 2 squared. And that's it. Now we just do it out, and um, it's here we go. Uh, so Isaac, what's, what's 4 minus negative 1 squared? Uh, 25. Yep, 25. Uh, Plus, uh, Nick, what's negative 2 minus 3 squared? No, not, not 1 or negative 5. Anyone help him out with that one? Negative 2 minus 3 squared. No, not negative 1. Yeah, how much? 25, right? Negative 2 minus 3 is negative 5. And negative 5 times negative 5 is another 25. And Jaden, how about 5 minus 2 squared? How much? Minus 2 squared is 1. Uh, not 1. Oh, that's a... 5 minus 2 and then squared. Oh, and then squared. Um, 9. 9. Okay. So the distance between these two points in 3D um, unless they ask you to simplify it, there's not much more we can do other than just add up what's there. Um, so, Connor, what do I get for the um, for the distance? Uh, yep, that's it. Okay. Just like always, if you got something like square root of twelve, you'd want to break that down into like two square roots of three. Okay. If they gave me labels, like if they said this is on a coordinate system where each unit is measured in feet. I would have put the label feet, but I don't know what the I don't know what the label is. Okay, so any question on finding distance in three D? So that's not really a vector problem. It, it is one I'm going to ask you, but it's just finding distance between two points. It's just kind of an easy thing to do in three D before we start getting into vectors. Okay, so now we're going to stay in three D. Now we're going to start doing some stuff with vectors. Okay, so everything I put on the board, this is all stuff you have in your notes from Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Okay, this part is all reviewed. So in 2D, you have, I'm not going to say a horizontal and a vertical component anymore, because in 3D, horizontal and vertical can be a little confusing. In 2D, it's not, but 3D, it can be. So I'm going to say that that is the x-axis component. And that is the y-axis component. What letter do you think I'm going to use for the z-axis component? C. C is going to be the component. And now what letter 
do you think I'm going to put next to C? We're going to put K. So remember, these are bold. And since they're bold, that means what? They're vectors. Right. So I is the unit vector that points in the positive x-axis. J is the unit vector that points on the positive y-axis. K is the unit vector that points on the positive z-axis. So now, taking i, j's, and k's, you can stack them together in 3D to build whatever vector you need to build. Just take as many i's, j's, and k's as you need. Um, and remember, if you want to go the other way, what do you do to one of those vectors? Yeah. So if, you know, if, if k went one way and you wanted it to be a negative and go the other way, you just make it negative. So remember, a, b, and c, those are the actual components. The x, the y, and the z. Two ways we can write it. You can use the angle brackets and just put horizontal, comma, vertical. Well, I shouldn't say that. X component, comma, Y component, and then the Z component. If you don't want to write it with the angle brackets, we can use IJK. AI plus BJ plus CK. That's basically how you write it. Um, okay. Now, when we sketch vectors, I said there is no standard point you have to start from. But what point do you usually start from when you want to sketch a vector? Yeah? The origin. The origin. And if your vector starts from the origin, it has a special name. It has <coughs> the same name in 3D that it did in 2D. Does anybody remember what it's called? Um, we're going to talk about that. So unit vector means it's a length of 1. But this means you have a vector that starts at the origin. Yep. Is it a scalar vector? Um, no, not a scalar. We're going to talk about scalars, though. That just is a number that makes it longer or shorter. Position vector? What? Position vector? A position vector. Yep. You have that exact sentence in your notes from, from Monday. A vector that has the initial point at the origin is still called a position vector, even though now it's 3D. It still has the same name. So first formula we're going to look at is how do you find a position vector in 3D? Okay. I'll remind you of how we did it in 2D, and then I want you to take the pattern, extend it, and do it for 3D. Okay. So this you have in your notes from Monday. It's the very last thing we did right before the example, last example in your notes. To find a position vector. Subtract the x components, comma, subtract the y components. Where are those coming from? Well, those are coordinates. x1 and y1 would be the coordinate of the initial point. x2, y2, the terminal point. Okay, when we do an actual problem, you're going to have all numbers in those spots. Okay, so that was 2D. Now. Let's look at it in 3D. Okay. All you really need, if you're making a reference sheet, all you need is the 3D formulas. Because if I give you a problem that's not 3D, just go like this. Just cross out everywhere you see a Z. And then just use it like that. And there you go. There's the 2D formula. Okay, so I would, if I'm making a reference sheet, I wouldn't put like a whole list of 2D formulas and then a whole list of 3D formulas. <coughs> They're the same. Let's see. Okay, so in 3D, initial point has an x, a y, and a z value. The terminal point has an x, a y, and a z part to the coordinate. So if you look at the 2D formula, what do you think I'm going to have to put onto that formula to get the 3D version? We need a comma, and then what would come after it? Z2 minus z1. Yep. So there's how you find a position vector in 3D. Okay. So if you put that on your reference sheet, I give you a problem on the test that's 2D, just go like this. Don't use that last part. Just use the first two. Okay. 
Okay, so that's why I said today is kind of like a review because we're going over every important formula that we did Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Okay, so let's find the uh, position vector between P1 and P2. If they don't tell you which one is the initial and the terminal, I explained it right up here. Initial is always P1, terminal is always P2. Why, um, why is that important? <coughs> why does it really matter which one is which? Right, you can't switch the order and get the same answer. Right? We're doing subtraction, so order is very important. Right, so we just gotta make sure we get the order right. Okay, so let's start with the um, first calculation for the, the horizontal component. Um, Kylie, what would I subtract right here and what order? Just make sure you give it to me in the right order. Four minus negative one. Yep, four minus negative one, comma. Uh, and Rebecca, what would be the um, calculation for the y-axis component? Six minus two. So we get six minus two, comma. And Greta, how about the z-axis? Um, two minus three. Two minus three. And then just simplify as much as you can. So five, four, negative one. Now, if they didn't write it that way, and they wrote it with the ijk, can someone just tell me how to write it that way instead? Five i plus four j minus um, k. Yep, five i plus four j minus k. Both the answers are correct. It's just two different ways of writing it. Is there any question how we wrote it with the vectors i j k versus five four negative one? Okay, and again, technically, these should be both. So if you were trying to build this, like let's say I gave you Lego blocks, and I said the red ones were I's, and the blue ones were J's, and the green ones were K's. Well, you'd take five of the red ones and stack them together. You'd take four of the blue ones and put those on the end. And then you'd take one of the green ones, and you'd have it go the other way, okay? because it's negative. That's what you would do. So it's, it's like the building blocks for this vector. All right. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at um, all the formulas we did. I think we did them on Tuesday for adding, subtracting, scaling, and finding the magnitude. But we're going to do them the way we did Tuesday. We're not going to draw anything out. Um, technically, you can add vectors in 3D the same way we did it in 2D. You can just put one on the end of the other in 3D. But that's it's kind of hard to draw. So remember, in 2D, if you wanted to add those two vectors up, you would start by adding the x's. Then you put a comma. Then you would add the y's. And you would put a comma. And what's going to have to be the third thing that I do now? Because it's in 3D. Add the z's. Let me just zoom out a little bit. So now we just add the z's. And I just combined addition and subtraction into the same, same formula. If you want to subtract v minus w, subtract the x's, subtract the y's, and now the extra step, subtract the z's. And pretty much the same formula, just extending the pattern for the z's. Okay, so now when you put a number in front of a vector, you can call it a number. Like if you had 3v, does anyone remember the other name we call it? When you put a number in front of a vector? Yeah. Scalar. It's a scalar. And what are the three things that can happen when you scale a vector? Connor? You can get larger or shorter. Longer, shorter, there's two. And what's the third thing? 
It can change the direction, right? Not just any direction, but it can point exactly the opposite way. Um, what kind of scalar would you have to have to make it change direction? A negative. Yep. Okay. So in 2D, if you want to scale a vector, you take the x component, multiply it by your scalar. Y component <coughs> times the scalar. What am I going to have? What's under the gray screen thing to make it 3D? It's going to be under there. Alpha Z? Yeah, alpha Z, which one? Z1 or Z2? Z1. Yeah, Z1 because we're doing vector V. Vector V is all the ones. If I wanted to scale vector W, then there would have been the twos. All right. So we've got each component being scaled or multiplied by the number of times. So just do it to the third one. Okay. And the last formula um, for this one is the, what do these bars stand for? Magnitude. And in 2D, what is the formula for the magnitude based on? It's not really like its own thing. It's really just another formula. Yeah? Right. So in 2D, if that was your vector, all you'd have to do is make it a triangle, find the length of that side, find the length of that side, and use the Pythagorean theorem. So in 2D, you'd have something like that. the square root of the x component squared plus the y component squared. And what am I going to have under there to make it 3D? I got to square the z component. This is still the Pythagorean theorem. So all that that formula is, that is the Pythagorean theorem. It's the Pythagorean theorem in 3D. Okay? When you do a squared plus b squared equals c squared, that's 2D. Well, in 3D, that's what it would be. Okay. And the easiest way to kind of visualize what you're doing, if you're trying to think of Pythagorean theorem in 3D, is kind of like this. Um, Let's see, this would be, let's have this be the back, so you wouldn't see this. And you wouldn't see this either. All right, so Pythagorean theorem in 3D is basically like trying to find the distance from here, which is like the back, let's call that the back left bottom, to here, which is like the front right Top. I mean, I can use real fancy words, but I know some people don't like big words. So use I could use arbitrary words. So what you're basically finding is something like that. It's the distance across the box inside, but it's a 3D distance from like the back to the, the lower part in the back to the top part in the front. Yep. <laughs> so it's, it's Pythagorean theorem in 3D. It's a little weird to see, but like if they gave you these two sides, the first thing you would have to find is this. Okay. That's a right angle. I know it doesn't look like a right angle, but remember, it's a cube. So it, it is a right angle. And then once you have this side, as long as you gave me the height, that's another right angle. So to find the diagonal inside a box, I would have to do Pythagorean theorem twice, which is exactly what this formula is. It's the Pythagorean theorem in 3D, or the 2D version twice. That's all it is. Okay, so we'll, uh, let's look at an example. We won't go through all, but maybe we'll pick two or three of those and um, just try it. Right, so there shouldn't be any sketching um, required for this. 
Okay, so here's our uh, two vectors, V and W. First thing I want to do is add them on. <coughs> and because we can write the answer two different ways, let's practice both. Just so for the test, you're kind of comfortable with either way. Okay, so if I add those up, um, Megan, when I add them up, what would be the um, x-axis component? Could you do like 3 plus 2, 4? Yep. Specifically, if you want to be picky about the order, it would be 2 plus 3. But it's not subtraction, so the order isn't as important. And what would you guess? 5. 5. And what letter do you put next to it so I know that that represents the x-axis component? Would you put i? Yep. 5 i. 5 i. All right. Uh, Madison, how about the y-axis component? What number would that be? Seven. Um, <coughs> oh, careful, we're negative. adding them. If you subtracted them, I agree, it would be 7. Yeah, negative 1. Negative 1? And what letter do you put with that one? J. J. All right, so we got 5i minus 1j. You could have just put minus j, same thing. Uh, and Michael, what about the z-axis component? Three. Three, and we put a K with that. Okay. Questions on that? Right. And Devin, what if I want to write that in this notation? How would I do it? It would just be five, negative one, three. Five, negative one, three. Questions on either one. Okay, so that's adding them. Um, let's skip subtracting. Let's do uh, magnitude. Okay, so I want to find the magnitude of V. <coughs> so you don't need W for this at all. Just V. Okay, uh, Nate, what would be the first thing I would write down to find the magnitude of V? Find the magnitude of the first thing you're writing down with the square root. Yep, let's put the square root. And now we're finding the magnitude of V. Um, so, well, what will be the first thing I put under the um, square root? Uh, under the square root? Yep, to find the magnitude of V. 5. Uh, so. If, if we were doing something with w, that would be the last thing we would square. But we're doing, we can ignore the, the w, we don't need it. Two squared. Two squared, right? So we're finding the magnitude of v. Here's v. And the formula for the magnitude was right here. Square the x. Square the y, square the z. Right, so let me go back. There's the x, there's the y, there's the z. So Haley said 2 squared. So that's the first one. So what would be the, what would be the second one? Though, that I would do? <coughs> 3. 3. 3, uh, three squared. Squared, yep. So 3 squared. And Kat, how about the um, last part? Yeah, it doesn't really make a difference because when you square two or negative two, it comes out the same. Okay, four nines four. What does that add up to? Seventeen. Just like in two D, if you could reduce the square root, you would. If they wanted a decimal, you type it in. If they don't, just leave it like that. Questions on that? So that's a 3D magnitude. And last thing is we're going to scale the vector w. Okay, I want to make it three times as long. Um, so Alec, if I scale w and make it <coughs> three times as long, what do I have to do to, to each number here, basically? What's the arithmetic? Multiply each of them by three. Yeah, 
So it's just 9i minus 12j plus 15k. That's it. So 9, negative 12, 15. Nine I minus twelve J plus fifteen K. Any um, questions on that? <clears throat> so now, what what did we um, do yesterday that involved finding magnitudes as part of the formula? Yeah. Finding the angle. Finding the angle. Yes. And to find the angle, what did we need to do in the top of the fraction? The dot product. So let's look at how we do the dot product in 3D. Um, if you know how to do it in 2D, I probably could just give you a 3D problem and you could pretty much figure it out. It's, um, it's exactly what you would expect. Okay, so in 2D, you multiply the x components together plus you multiply the y components together and you'd be done. What's the one extra step you think I'm going to have to do for 3D? Multiply the z components together. Multiply whatever the z components are and add those onto it. Now what kind of answer would this be? Same kind of answer it was yesterday. Whenever you do a dot product, you always get a what? Number. Number. <laughs> Multiply two numbers, you get a number. So you're going to end up with a number plus a number plus a number. That's a number. Okay? When you do dot product, you don't you get a number. When you do cross product, you get a. I'll tell you later. You have to hang. stay stay for a little longer, and I'll tell you. Unless you don't care. All right. So let's find the. Uh, the dot product between these two vectors. So here's V and W. So V is 2, negative 3, 6. W is 5, 3, negative 1. I've written them out as unit vectors. You could see them in either notation on the test. All right. Um, so Isaac, what's going to be the first two things I would multiply together here to start my dot product. Two times five. Yep. Two times five. And what comes right after that? Uh, plus. Plus. And now, how about, um, Nick, can you tell me the next two? Uh, negative three and three. Negative three and three. And what comes <coughs> right after that? Six and negative one. Uh, before that. Plus, yep. And now the last part, he just said 6 and negative 1. Okay, um, so Jaden, 2 times 5 gives me... Oh, sorry, I said plus 10. Yep, 10. Uh, Connor, negative 3 times positive 3? Negative 9. Negative 9. And Rebecca, 6 times negative 1? Negative 6. Negative 6. So we're going to get 1 plus negative 6, which gives me a dot product of what? Negative 5. Negative 5. Now, the next thing we're going to get into is the angle. But what do you think you could tell me about these two vectors right now, knowing that the dot product is negative 5? It is they are not perpendicular. Yeah. yeah, the angle here is not 90 degrees. What is the angle? Well. That's what we'll talk about next. Is this a cross product? <coughs> nope, this is the angle between two vectors in 3D. You'll know when it's cross product. It'll say cross product like that. <laughs> that would be the last thing you do. <coughs> so, angle between two vectors in 3D. It's the same formula as yesterday. And if you're thinking, well, wait, why didn't the formula change? Every other formula we had to like do something to make it 3D. Well, you did, right? You made the dot product 3D, and we talked about that. Uh, where we do that? Right here. So we already made the dot product 3D. So we took care of that. The magnitudes are also 3D. And we took care of that when we did 
this right here. So we already talked about how to do a 3D magnitude. We already talked about how to do a 3D, bless you, 3D dot product. And now we're just putting it all together in the, in the formula. So the cosine of theta equals a 3D dot product over a 3D magnitude times another 3D magnitude. All things you just did. We're just putting them all in the same formula. So what I'm going to do is find the angle between the two vectors we just had up above. Because we already did one of the three things. Okay. So same two vectors we, I think, did I rename them though? I think I used the same numbers. Um, I call them V and W up above. I can, I can just call them, well now I'm calling them U and V. Different names, same numbers. Just get used to different things. <coughs> Now we're going to find u dot v. Well, we just did that. What did the dot product come out to when we did these two? Negative 5. Negative five. So that's done. Um, what's the next thing I need? Negative. Length of u. So let's find that. Length of u. Um, Kylie, to find the length of u, I already put the square root. Well, what's the first thing that goes under the root? Two squared, two squared which is? Four. Four. Good. How about the next thing? Negative three squared, which is nine. Yep, perfect. So four plus nine, and one more. And 36. And 36. So if we add up four, nine, and 36, what does that give me? The square root of? 49, which comes out to 7. seven. Now, the fact it came out to a nice answer, uh, who cares? Um, it's not the final answer to the problem, so it doesn't really matter. It comes out to whatever it comes out to. And now the magnitude of V. Uh, Emily, what's going to go under the root for the magnitude of V? Me? Yeah. <coughs> It's 5 squared plus 3 squared plus 9 plus squared. So 25 plus... 9. Oh, keep going. Yeah. 1. 1. 1. <laughs> what is that anything else? Oh. Any, anything else? What is anything else? I'm just asking. Is there anything else? You said what goes under it. That's it. Yeah, you're right. That's it. <laughs> so that gives me the square root of 35. 35. <laughs> okay. So now we've, we've got everything we need. We've got the dot product. We've got the magnitude. We've got the other magnitude. Fill it all in. Dot product, magnitude, magnitude. Okay, so dot product in the top. Um, so we need some more space. Negative 5, product of the magnitudes in the bottom, 7 square root 35. Don't even do that out. I'm just going to type that all in in one step. Now, that's not equal to my angle. That's equal to what? Cosine. The cosine of my angle. So we want to get rid of cosine. Inverse. Inverse. Inverse on the left. Inverse on the right. As long as you're careful, you can type all that in in one step. You just need a couple sets of parentheses. So inverse cosine. I'm going to change to degrees after, but I can do that right before I hit enter. Negative 5. Open a parenthesis for the denominator. 7 square root 35. Get out of the square root and close the denominator and then close the entire function. Wouldn't it be negative 5 divided by um, Yes. Thank you. How did you just add that in? Yeah. I just did second insert. If you press second insert, it'll start putting things in rather than over, overwriting that's there. Second insert. Now, once you press this arrow, 
Now it's blinking black again. It's not going to insert again. It only is going to insert if it's <coughs> blinking like white. Okay. So I want to delete what I just put in though. And there, there we go. So angle between the two vectors, that's in radians. But I'm going to change it to degrees. And you type it in the same way. It's 96.93 degrees. Well, we knew it wasn't uh, we knew it wasn't 90 because the dot product didn't come out to zero, um, but it's close. It's a little bigger than 90. Any questions on that? All right. Now we're on cross product. So the cross product is the only thing that we did we're doing today that's new. Um, we never did cross product before because you can't. Cross product does not exist in 2D. Only exists in um, in 3D. So what is it? It's a second way to multiply vectors. That's why if somebody gave me two three-dimensional vectors and said multiply them, I'd say you, you need to be more specific. How? Do you want me to multiply them with a dot product? Or do you want me to multiply them with a cross product? They're two totally different things. Okay. And the symbol, well, I already said this to you, it only applies to 3D vectors. And the symbol for cross product, goes right between the two vectors. Anyone have a guess what the symbol is? Yeah, it's like a cross, yeah. It's like an X. So that's the symbol for cross product. We don't normally use an X in higher math because X's can look like variables. I just make the X a little smaller than what's around it, and then it just looks like a little cross between the two. Okay. So that's the symbol, and the way you pronounce it, you just say V cross W. Don't say V times W, because then times doesn't mean anything. Dot means something, cross means something. Times means nothing. Um, and the applications, we don't really get into many applications, but uh, there are applications in physics and, and geometry. One that I've done in my other class with the physics has to do with torque, pulling on a lever. Um, but we're just going to look at how you find a cross product and what is special about it. So we'll find it, and then we're going to see that the answer we get isn't, it's not just a random thing, it's, it's special. It's not an arbitrary. It's not arbitrary. It's special. Okay. Uh, all right, so let me show you how we find cross product. Okay, so the way we're going to find the cross product is to use Saris's rule. Uh, this is not the fastest way to do it. The reason why we're doing it this way is because it requires the least amount of explanation. It's the easiest way to understand. Okay. To use Saris's rule, um, or actually, even just to do a cross product in general, it involves finding what's called a determinant of a matrix. So if you know how to find determinants, then you already know how to do cross product. If you don't know how to find that fancy word that I just said, Saris's rule basically automatically does it for you, and you don't even know you're doing it. You don't have to know you're doing it. Okay? It's just kind of built into this little formula. So again, not the fastest way but it's the way that requires me to teach you the least amount of extra stuff to do cross product. So, to do a cross product, they're going to give you two vectors. Now, there's going to be a lot of numbers. A1, B1, C1 will all be numbers. A2, B2, C2 will all be numbers. Kind of like that. 2, 3, 5, 1, 2, 3. All numbers. So the first thing we're going to do is create a matrix. A matrix is just a fancy way of saying you want to line things up in rows and columns. Right? When you say three by three matrix, those are the dimensions of it. How many rows are you going to have? Three. How many columns? Three. Okay. And I'm going to show you what goes in the rows and columns. Um, don't worry about the stuff that I've circled. 
We'll just put that up here because we don't need that right now. And don't worry about this either yet. So the first row is just going to have the vectors i, j, k. The second row is going to have a1, b1, c1. That's what goes in the second row. And those will all be numbers. In the third row, a2, b2, c2. So after that step, you should have something like that. Those are all numbers. So it looks like a lot of letters right now, but it's not going to be when we do it. Any questions on that? So there's one more step to setting up, the, I call this the picture that we're going to use. There's one more step to setting up the picture, and then we can just look at the picture and do the calculation. Last step is, and I think I wrote it right here, copy columns one and two. So you're going to take those two columns, and you're going to make a copy of them to the right of column three. So you're going to take what's in that box, copy and paste it to the right of column three. So after you do that, it's going to look like this. IJ, copy that. A1, B1. A, uh, A2, B2. So now what you've created is a three by five matrix. Three rows, five columns. The last two columns are just repeats of the first two. <coughs> That's all you have to do to set up Saris's rule. That's the setup. Now we just have to look at some diagonals. Any questions on how we got to this step? Okay, there's six diagonals in there. This doesn't count as a diagonal. That's not a diagonal. Diagonals have to have three things. They have to go all the way from the top, all the way to the bottom. So where are the six diagonals? There's one. There's two. There's three. Notice all of those diagonals go down and to the right. In a second, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to color code it on the board to make it easier. Um, if you don't have different colored pens, that's fine. It'll still work. The three other diagonals, they don't go down and to the right. They go down and to the left. One, two, three. And I have it, I drew it a little nicer down below where I actually didn't draw over the letters. I wasn't super careful, but here's basically what you got. Three that go down into the right, three that go down into the left. And I called them blue one, blue two, blue three. Red one, red two, red three. Just to give them names. And I like Star Wars, so red two is like the next one. Uh, anyway, so we've got all of our um, diagonals named. If you don't have different colors, you could just call them one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Any questions on what I circled? I just circled some diagonals. When you're actually doing the problem, you don't have to circle them if you don't want them. I'm just circling them so I can show you what I'm looking at. Okay, and now here's the calculation you do with that picture. You take everything that's in red one and you multiply it together. So you're gonna have an i times a number times a number. I don't know what the number will be, but it, it'll be a number. So i times number times number. Plus, do the same thing on red two. J times number times number. So maybe it'll be like 7J, something like that. And then do the same on red three. K times number times number. So you multiplied everything on the diagonals that go down into the right, and you added them. Now on the diagonals that go down into the left, you do the same thing. You're going to multiply them, but you subtract them. So you're going to do k times number times number and subtract it. And the same for blue 2, the same for blue 3. i times number times number. 
So the product of blue 2, subtract it. And then the product of blue 3, j times a number times another number, and subtract it. So you multiply three diagonals and add. You multiply three diagonals and subtract. And once we fill in numbers for all the A's and B's, it, um, it's a lot simpler to explain, and it's actually a pretty fast calculation. Not quite as fast as dot product, but it's, um, it's definitely quicker than finding an angle between two vectors. This is faster. Okay. Once you set up your diagram. Okay, so I'll leave, it, I'll leave it on the side while we do it. Okay, and I'll scroll back. All right, so you start by setting up three rows, three columns. What goes in the first row? What letters? I, J, K. So just start with an I, a J, a K. What three numbers are going to go right below it? Two, three, five. Yep. Two, three, five. And what numbers are going to go below that? One, two, three. One, two, three. Yep. Good. Now the last thing we have to do to finish setting it up is to what? What's the last thing I have to do? Yep. Just copy over the first two columns. So, I J. Two, three. One, two. Okay, you're done. Now we do the calculation down and to the right. I'm just going to, well, if I draw a line through it, I don't think it'll be too thick. I think you'll still be able to read it. I times three times three is how much? Nine I. Nine I. Yep. <coughs> how about? J times 5 times 1. 5J. 5J. K2 or 2. 4K. Okay, so that's the first half. Now uh, we can switch and go the other way. K3, 1. Minus, you remember that minus, 3K. I five two minus ten I J two three minus six J. I'm gonna make that bigger so we can um, see it. And now let's write our final answer. What's nine I minus ten I? Negative I. Yep. So we got we got that. We got that. Uh, what's 5j minus 6j? Negative what? J. Yep. Negative j. So we got that. We got that. What about 4k minus 3k? K. K. And if you look at that, what kind of answer is that? Is that a number or a vector? It's a vector. So when you do the cross product, the answer is a vector. Now, Negative i minus j plus k. Let me write that down. Negative i plus j minus k. Uh, you switched to j, k. Oh, did I? Negative i minus j. Thank you. That would have messed things up. Um, can someone just tell me what was v? What was the original problem? 2i plus 3j plus 5. And what was w? I plus 2J plus 3K. Thank you. Now, let's find the dot product. What do I want to find the dot product between? Let's do this one and this one. Negative 1 times 2. Yep, I'll do that in one second. Plus negative 1 times 3. 
plus 1 times 5. Now watch what happens. What's negative 1 times 2? Negative 2. What's negative 1 times 3? Negative 3. And 1 times 5? So if you add those up, what do you get? Zero. Zero. So this was the cross product. And these are the originals. So the dot product between the original and the cross product came out to zero. So what does that mean? They're orthogonal. And that always happens. Every time you find a cross product, it is orthogonal to both vectors that you started with. I didn't check the other one, but if you did, you would get negative 1 minus 2 plus 3. Negative 1 minus 2 plus 3 is also 0. So the cross product, I think I have it written um, right here. The cross product is orthogonal to both of the original vectors. That's what the cross product does. Any question on that? So cross product requires a little bit of work to set up that picture, and that picture is called Saris's rule. But once you set up a picture, you just multiply three things, add them, multiply three, and subtract. And that's cross product. So the homework, um, tonight it's mostly in the packet, except for the last problem. It's in the packet, it's 15, 17, 29 to 35 odd, 41, 43, and 51. So it's not really a lot of problems in the packet. But then I just want you to take and find the cross product between these two vectors. 3, negative 2, 4, negative 5, 3, negative 8. Um, reminder, I'll be after school today. Um, if you have not finished last week's test, and there's about seven of you, um, that has to be done by tomorrow or it's a zero. So remember, at this point, we're pretty much done with tests for the third term. This tomorrow's test is going to go on term four. But I'm going to put all the homework, even tonight's homework, I'm going to keep that on term three.